Tatum's chapter 12, where we read verses 7 through 10. Paul writes, And the lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in the weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in deeds, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here ends our epistle reading. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Hallelujah.
marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. The Christ, the anointed one of God, takes the gospel offense when dealing with the fallen world. Isaiah had told of better days under this Christ who would preach these glad tidings to the poor and heal the brokenhearted and proclaim victory to the captives and open the prison to those who were bound. And the people there in the synagogue, they had knowledge of these words too. It's not like it was the first time they had ever heard it. They would have been familiar with the promises of the Messiah. So when the text had been read, Jesus wasted no time in telling them that the fulfillment was there in their midst. The scripture had indeed been fulfilled in him. And truly, there is no gospel without Jesus. There is no forgiveness. There is no freedom like that which he is talking about. There is no life without the one who freely gave his life bore the burden of the law and forgives out of a boundless and selfless love. Through those words that he spoke that day in fulfillment of Isaiah's words, the people heard the mission statement of the Lord. Truly, this greatest prophet was on the gospel offense to share the liberty of salvation to a world that was trapped in its bondage. This account is recorded in three different Places. And if you look at it, either Matthew 13, Mark 6, like our reading, or Luke 4, you'll notice that the reaction to this news wasn't exactly acclamation. It should have been. This is great news. The Messiah is coming. <coughs> but it wasn't. And notice how they talk themselves out of believing him, even here in our own reading, if we look at verses 2 and 3 again. Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And it says that they were offended by him. The answers to those questions, by the way, were obvious. Where did he get these things? Well, he got them from God. It was written in the very word that he had read to them moments prior. Now, what wisdom is this that is given to him again? Look to that word of God, that precious, sacred, pure, undeniable word of God. And it says that even his own works gave him no reason to doubt it. They just said that they were mighty. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Yes. And this should have been something that would be a cause of great joy to know that God's anointed came from their midst in their own hometown and was there in their midst in the synagogue on that Sabbath. But notice how they cycled through the same set of preconceived notions that skeptics still hold to today. Instead of trusting in God that he had sent his son into the world, they hardened their hearts and they rejected a clear and simple message. And instead of a godly zeal at the gospel offense that the Savior took, they instead took offense at the gospel. In their sin, they mocked and rejected what was literally right in front of their eyes. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And yes, that's where he was. He was in the house of the Lord. He was among his own relatives. He was in the land where he grew up. But this wasn't a welcoming as the old saying goes, you can't go home again. And what we have there in the text that Jesus talks about, that's also an old saying, one that we're perhaps not familiar with, at least not in a modern context, but it was certainly something that they understood at the time. The prophet is not without honor, except in his own house. Pride had 
spirit of division, they wrath, envy, they were convinced that Jesus could not be who he said he was. At another point in scripture, we're told outright that his brothers, which were then his half-brothers or cousins, said that even they didn't believe him. The fact of the matter was that Jesus offered something new on that Sabbath day, but he did not contradict the word of God in doing so. The scripture was fulfilled that day. What Jesus taught in the synagogue and out in public was the word of God. He was offering clarity of the gospel, building upon that which had been made known to them through the law and through the prophets. And he didn't come to abolish those either. Do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Those who are offended by the gospel are offended because it is just so, so simple. That's something that they fail to realize. It's so simple that the Lord, the Lord's anointed, came from their homeland. It's easy enough to believe, but they reject it. That the Lord Jesus Christ came to the flesh to live and to die for us is so clearly stated in Scripture that anything to the contrary could not be true. And yet for generations, even since the beginning of time, people have put their own spin on salvation and attempted to rob God of his glory. But the gospel is easy for us. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. It was true that this Jesus who stood there in their midst would not be the bread king that the Jews so desperately wanted him to be. But this king would rule more than just the land or a people. He would rule all lands and all people. And it was true that Jesus would not be like Moses or Elijah. No, he would be greater. This prophet would bring peace to a people who were captive in their sin. He would show them the righteousness that he brings through faith. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring down Jesus from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? And Paul here is talking about an Old Testament passage that he's about to bring up. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The law and the prophets another way of saying the Old Testament. It pointed those people there on that Sabbath day to the teacher who stood up to read from Isaiah 61. The message then is the message still today. Had they been paying attention, not hard in their hearts, had they not been so prideful, they might have seen the obvious right there. Instead, the law and its burden ruled and recklessly defended their hearts. But the gospel is ever on the offense. And we have the sure prophetic word confirmed. All these years later, the gospel is the same. And we can go back to that most basic of passages, one that most of the children even know, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's grace. It's a gift. It's 
undeserved, and yet it has been given to us freely, despite all of our sin and all of the wrong that we have committed in our lives. Jesus, we're told here in the account, marveled at the people's disbelief because they were offended at the truth. His own countrymen, even his own family, grew angry with him. And it says that he could do no, no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And just a note about that uh, short little text there, Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do, whatever he willed to do. But without love, those miracles had no benefit for those there. But who did Jesus attend to there before he left and went on his way to preach on the circuit, to continue to share the word of God? It says that it was only the sick that he attended to in Nazareth. There is no pride there. They needed their Savior. They would need to rely on him alone for their cure. And we realize by faith that we too rely on Jesus to be our strength and our portion and our only cure. The righteous, or at least those who think that they are righteous, think that they have no need for a Savior. But they do. They just don't think so. That's why it's so important that the gospel go on the offense into all the world to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and life to sinners. That's why it's so important that it has gone out to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim victory to the captives, that it has opened the prison to those who were bound, that it has proclaimed the acceptable year of the Lord. Yeah, you're going to find that many people still take offense to the grace of God, to that wonderful gospel message which he's given us. We look at history, we can see a few examples of people who took offense to it. Maybe you heard of this guy named Saul who was persecuting Christians. He took great offense at the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe even James and Joseph, two of the men who are mentioned here in the text, brothers of Jesus, who we find out in uh, the book of John did not believe him. And yet if we fast forward to the book of Acts, these two are uplifted as faithful examples of the members of the church. This gospel that the Spirit works through is powerful. It changes hearts. It changes people. And what a wonderful thing that is. Not just for them, but for us and for all those that you go out to witness to. And perhaps you have taken offense at the simplicity of the gospel like some of those people. Maybe you struggle with it now or when you leave here and you're off on your own with your own thoughts and when you're staring at the ceiling at night wondering and thinking about all of the terrible things that you might have done. Maybe it's a family member or somebody that you witness to who takes offense to it. Well, Jesus knows of that. He knows of your struggle. He knows of their struggle. And he has dealt with it. He dealt with it in a sense, personally, when the world denied him. And he felt the sting of that unbelief there in his own country. But he really dealt with it when he hung there from the cross shedding his innocent blood for you, for me, for them, for the whole world. It is in the word that we hear of his life, death, resurrection, and not only these things, but of his eternal rule that will continue forevermore. And it's in there that it assures us of this life, and not just this life, but this forgiveness of sins that we have in him. So we pray that that gospel never be offensive to us, but that it always be on the offense in the world that so desperately needs it. But let our trust be in him for all things, and let us welcome him and rejoice in him who has made our hearts his home. Amen.
is God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to worship and praise you, the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Establish our hearts firmly in your word that we may trust all that you promise and obey that all that you command, lest we come behind in any blessing you desire to give us. Move us daily to sincerely repent, and when we come confessing our many transgressions, enable us to trust your great mercy. Give us faith to lay our burdens of sin upon the cross of Christ, knowing that he has surely purchased our salvation with his own blood. Keep us your heirs of everlasting life, faithful through the Holy Scripture, giving us grace to believe every word, confess faithfully and truthfully every doctrine, obey every commandment, and heed every exhortation. Make us ready at all times to defend the truth, to give answer to all who ask us concerning the hope we have in Christ. Through your word, be our guide and constant companion, that we might be led to shun all that is sinful and choose those things that are appropriate for our high calling as your dear children and heirs of eternal life. Keep our faith from failing. In times of trouble, teach us to look to you as our helper. In times of sorrow, as our comforter. In times of weakness is our strength, in times of peril is our protector, in times of need is our benefactor. We give thanks for all the blessings you so bountifully bestow upon our bodies and spirits. May we serve you with the best of our gifts and abilities. Sanctify us and make us ready to do every good work. Gather the members of this congregation regularly that we may worship you and hear your word. Through the precious gospel of salvation that is shared by all, increase the bond of brotherly love among us. Remind us to pray for one another and make us willing to share one another's burdens. Preserve us from being so heavily frightened with the affairs of this life that we fail to give adequate time and attention to your word. Help us to grow full Christian maturity through the spiritual food which you so graciously set before us. Watch over us as the apple of your eye, and preserve for us the freedom to enjoy in this favored land. We ask all this in Jesus' name, and we ask also that you hear us when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy God. Savior Jesus Christ shed for me. Bring the shame of all your sins. And his true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Our peace.
body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life of pastor, our priest. Savior Jesus Christ, and His true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life of the pastor, our priest. Savior Jesus Christ.
the blood of our Lord and Savior sprinkled us with bread, meat, and truth day from the time of the last day.
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. 